if somebody will wake me up in the middle of the night and ask what is the cutest fossil in the world i will not hesitate to say trilobites these bugs were amazing first of all unlike dinosaurs preserved mostly as bare bones fossilized trilobites look exactly as they did 500 million years ago they crawled in the mud at the bottom of the sea from about 520 to 250 million years. They diversified into tens of thousands of different species. The forms their body took are truly fascinating and probably the main reason why people collect them. Many trilobites had spikes, weird appendages, eyes of unbelievable shapes. This video features a few examples of common trilobites from our collection some cool specimens from gem shows, and as a bonus, at the end you will see how broken shell of a prehistoric marine slug called Straparolus was put together as a puzzle. Look at these eyes, which, by the way, are the first known compound eyes in the natural history of our planet. The lenses in these eyes are formed from calcite, and each eye can have from one to a thousand of small lenses arranged hexagonally. It's impossible to change the form of calcite lenses to adjust focus, but some trilobites came up with a design containing two crystals forming an optical pair called doublet, which is more flexible. Moreover, some trilobites had lenses with special profiles that minimize optical aberrations and increase the depth of field. Similar designs were used by physicists Christian Huygens and René Descartes in the 17th century. Higgins was the guy who discovered Titan, the moon of Saturn. Detailed research showed that the trilobites of Dalmanitina species might have had concentric bifocal lenses allowing them to see up close and far away. Amazing adaptation. Many trilobites have tower-like compound eyes, and it's easy to imagine how they dig into the sediment and hide there with their eyes sticking out, similar to fish like the flounder. A number of trilobite eye designs have been reported in scientific literature proving that the trilobites have done their share of optical experiments over millions of years. Sadly, at the end, it did not help them because they eventually went extinct. Nevertheless, they were hanging on for 230 million years, much, much longer than humans exist. So, I would not call it a total failure. One order of the trilobites called Agnostida is believed to be eyeless. Here are a few of those creatures still embedded in Matrix. They look like miniature versions of Spanish castanets, used to produce rhythm for the flamenco dance. I wonder if such trilobites moved by forcefully bringing together head and tail, cephalon and pygidium, similar to modern day scallops. Paranopsis, recently renamed into Itagnostus was a very ancient creature of the Middle Cambrian period. Although there are some speculations that agnostids were planktonic and floated, they were probably too heavy for that and are found in sediments formed in deep, cold water environment. This would explain the blindness if the animals lived too deep down to the bottom where the sunlight can't reach. Still, could they have eyes under the exoskeleton? like scallops, whose eyes are in the mantle between the valves. By the way, fragments of trilobites are often called trilobits. It seems to me that most of the fossilized trilobites are molted skins or exoskeletons, to be precise. The complete trilobites with legs are rarely found. Every little piece of trilobite armor has its name, and classification is based on the shape of those parts. The front assemblage of fused plates is called cephalon, the head. This particular specimen was found in Texas, and it seems to have a hypostome, a math plate, underneath its cephalon. Trilobites of Elrathia species are often found without cheeks, large plates that incomplete specimens located at the right and left sides of cephalon, right under the eyes. It is believed to be due to the way trilobites were molting. They arch their bodies, split open their cephalon, separating the central part from the side plates, and crawled out of the old exoskeleton like we would get out of a sleeping bag after a rough night at the campground. 
Molting pattern is used to study family lineage of trilobites, connecting the potential relatives. So, next time you see a trilobite with missing cheeks, think that it probably got away after departing with its old skin and went on with a happy life of a bottom dweller and a sediment sifter. The middle part, named the thorax, consists of multiple articulated segments, from two to over 100 in different species. Their function is to protect the gills and limbs. Very few trilobite remains have limbs preserved, but they look somewhat similar to those of another ancient arthropod called horseshoe crab, which is probably the closest living relative of trilobites. When searching through piles of trilobites for sale, watch for abnormalities in the rows of the segments. You may find a bite mark on some of them. This is a composite specimen from Morocco, a reconstruction made with two pieces, probably from two different animals. The front piece is an internal cast of the original shell, clearly lacks fine details of the external surface of the exoskeleton. Finally, the tail of a trilobite, or the rear end, consists of a few fused segments. It's called pygidium. The trilobites are often found in large numbers, so, in crowded spaces, they would probably have bumped into each other all the time. Hey, buddy, would you move your pygidium away from my cephalon, please? The ability to roll into a ball like an armadillo or roly-poly apparently had a protective function and might potentially be used not only to hide vulnerable body parts, but also to quickly swim away from predators. These light brown, semi-translucent trilobites are from limestone deposits in Oklahoma. A similar remarkable preservation can be observed in trilobites from Russia. The specimen you see was mined in one of several commercial quarries near a little town called Clorita. One of the largest trilobite specimens found so far was discovered in Canada. It's 28 inches or 70 centimeters long and now in the exposition of the Manitoba Museum. Needless to say, that if you see a beautiful trilobite on sale for a small price, beware. When trying to distinguish a cast from a real fossil, look for tiny details that can't be reproduced by plastering. For instance, micropores, where tiny hairs were probably attached, or bumps resembling goosebumps on our skin. The occurrence of microcracks means that it is a genuine fossil, unlike bubbles or air pockets, which form during molding, similar to those on surfaces of concrete. Keep in mind that fossils also can be partially restored, meaning that only part of it is authentic. Cruziana is a pretty name for trace fossils representing trilobite tracks. Well, I hope you enjoyed the short tale of trilobites. Do not forget to subscribe if you do not want to miss our next video, and continue to watch a restoration of a coiled shell of a gastropod from the Carboniferous period. This is how it looked when we found it, in Texas over 10 years ago, and you will see it after we glued the pieces together from a pile. I think it's gorgeous. The problem was that the pile actually contained pieces of two or three shells, but once we figured it out, the job was done quickly. According to a book by McKinsey and McLeod, this type of shell is called pseudoplanus spiral because, at first glance, they look bilaterally symmetrical. But, as you can see, they are not. The book also mentions that the shells may have chambers and can be mistaken for an ammonoid. It does look quite similar. Good luck!